There's a problem that has swirled around political science departments, law schools, historians' conversations for more than 100 years. It's a problem that lurks behind or pops up prominently in studies of the American founding by historians, as well as inquiries about the original intent or original meaning of the Constitution by lawyers and judges. It's called the Madison problem. And simply put, the Madison problem is this. Did James Madison have a significant change of mind between the time he was helping to propose write and then ratify the U.S. Constitution, that is from 1786 to 1789, and the time just a handful of years later that he helped to lead the opposition to the policies that were coming out of the George Washington and John Adams administrations. Why did he espouse a strong central government in the 1780s? Indeed, he wanted one that was stronger than the Constitution ultimately created, and then become an equally impassioned advocate of states' rights-based resistance to federal policies not a decade later. It's a question that recently has been given this label, the James Madison problem, which is uh, a label almost worthy of a Robert Ludlum novel. And how we answer it has implications far beyond a simple antiquarian interest in the mind of James Madison. Unless you're one of those very rare people who think it's entirely irrelevant or entirely uninteresting to try to plumb how the generation that created the Constitution may have actually and specifically understood it, it's an important question. And the answers that have been offered show that it's, that it's intricately, inter intricately intertwined with some of the most important questions even in the 21st century, matters like federalism, the relationship between the federal government and the states, and matters such as how best to protect personal rights. That is, whether we ought to trust more local or more centralized governments to do so. These are amazingly important issues. Here's what we know about James Madison in the months leading up to the Constitutional Convention of 1787. He wanted a much stronger, national or central or federal government. I'll be using those terms interchangeably, I'm sure. And the reason was uh, the disaster that was the 1780s. It's often referred to as the critical period because the economy was slumping. States were not cooperating in the ways that the Articles of Confederation, that is the first compact between the 13 colonies uh, become states, uh, had hoped. And things were not looking as if they would get any, get any better anytime soon. In the spring and summer of 1786, James Madison turned to a, a box of books that, James, that uh, Thomas Jefferson had sent to him uh, from his post as minister to France, books on history, politics, and commerce. And he found information there on nearly every experiment in Republican government or federal governments, uh, confederated uh, states, in world history. He found support for his argument that a stronger central government was needed to prevent the 13 American states from falling in, under the influence of some foreign power or from just collapsing altogether. Philip of Macedon had done precisely that to the weak Amphictyonic Confederation in ancient Greece, as he learned in a 13-volume history that Jefferson sent him and that he read in its original French. From extensive study, he compiled a lengthy paper of ancient and modern confederacies, and he outlined the structure of the Amphictyonic, the Achaean confederations of the ancient world, the Holy Roman Empire, the Swiss, the Netherlands, and he sought to identify the constitutional bonds of union in these ancient and more recent confederacies, how commerce was regulated, how they organized their diplomacy, how they coerced member states that didn't pull their own weight. In short, what worked and what failed in practice. In, practice. in August of 1786, after a summer spent reading these histories, he left for the Annapolis Convention, which was a precursor to the Philadelphia Convention that drafted the Constitution. On the way, he wrote that federal affairs were more gloomy than ever. He said, no money comes into the public treasury, trade is on a wretched footing, and the states are running mad after paper money. It's at about the same time, in 1786, that Shays' Rebellion broke out in Massachusetts. Under the leadership of Captain Daniel Shays, a respected revolutionary officer, a force that numbered about 2,000 men rose in armed insurrection to close the courts in Massachusetts, courts that were trying to prosecute indebted farmers who felt as if they had been impoverished, not because of anything they had done, but because of tax and monetary policies passed by an out-of-touch Eastern-dominated state government. Long story short, bad weather, poor leadership, killed the insurrection. Most surrendered and signed loyalty oaths. But just after, farmers showed more powers, these, these, these uh, previous uh, uh, insurrection, uh, insurrectionaries, is that a word, uh, showed more power at the polls than they had shown in their failed uh, rebellion. They elected a new governor, many new legislators, 
and began to get a response to their demands. This, it seems, scared James Madison even more than the failed rebellion. The former insurgents he saw were sheltering their wicked measures under the forms of the Constitution, as he wrote. Paper money was in the offing, offing and more inflationary measures. So in New York, serving in the Confederation Congress between mid-February and mid-April 1787, he drew up a list of the problems that were still plaguing the 13 states. Problems with the current structures of government. He's a month shy of his 36th birthday here, and he begins drafting a famous document uh, that we still read today called Vices of the Political System of the United States. And to sum it up, the 13 independent states since the Declaration had quarreled with each other, had thwarted policies intended for the good of the nation as a whole, and the root evil was the propensity of the, of the individual states to lose sight of the general welfare and the democratic excesses within these states that kept them from cooperating and maintaining their shared commitment to the common good of the nation. To fix that, Madison wanted a stronger central government, one in which both houses of Congress would have proportional representation, that is, states would be allocated their numbers of representatives and senators by population, not uh, uh, on an equal basis. This is something that smaller states during the convention were able to insist be revised so that only the House of Representatives had proportional representation. And Madison famously insisted that the federal government be, be given a national veto power over state laws. In other words, he wanted a stronger national government than the convention ultimately would pass because his commitment to a uh, national veto failed in the convention and he was depressed when it happened. He believed that his goals had been thwarted. They drafted and submitted a constitution that was much stronger than the Articles of Confederation, but not quite as strong as what Madison had wanted. During the ratification debates, as we all know, Madison worked hand in hand with Alexander Hamilton to persuade Americans of the merits of this new constitution. So closely allied were their views, their political vocabulary, that there were 12 essays in the Federalist, the uh, contributions that they made to uh, the New York ratification debate that are immensely influential in their time and in ours. That there were 12 essays in the Federalist that for the longest time, no one could say definitively whether Madison or Hamilton even wrote them. Uh, it's astonishing. Uh, Ma uh, Alexander Hamilton's essays in The Federalist have an average of 34.5 words per sentence. Madison's essays in The Federalist have an average of 34.6 words per sentence. Uh, the, these were men that not only shared a political vision, but shared a political vocabulary, and they worked hand in hand uh, to get this Constitution ratified. After the Constitution was ratified, one that again did not include Madison's national veto, Madison continued to be seen as what South Carolina Federalist William Lawton Smith called a great friend to strong government. And what he meant there was strong central government in August 1789. After the inauguration of George Washington, who chose Alexander Hamilton as his Treasury Secretary, things began to change from Madison's perspective. They established a British-style national bank which Madison was unsure about. The French Revolution, especially after 1793, pushed the issue of Washington's and Hamilton's Anglophilia to the, to the surface, further uh, frightening men like Madison and his friend Jefferson. And the Jay Treaty of 1795, with its indications that the United States might willingly assume a deferential role to the British, even if it was nominally independent after the Revolution, uh, further worried them. All in all, the policies of Hamilton and Washington seemed to be creating a fiscal military state, quite unlike uh, Madison may have envisioned in 1787. We can't be sure what exactly he had in mind. He wanted a stronger national government, but we're not certain that he really wanted a stronger British-style national government. Then, with John Adams, the successor to George Washington, elected in 1796, passing for Madison abhorrent restrictions on free speech and free press in the late 1790s, Madison finally began to voice active resistance to the strength of this national government uh, in a way that um, is best typified by the Virginia resolutions, which Madison offered, and the even stronger Kentucky resolutions, which his friend Thomas Jefferson authored, in which he insisted that states, the 13 states, have a right and are duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil uh, if federal efforts uh, to inappropriately enlarge their powers uh, seem uh, to be running out of hand. He believed this had happened with the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. And so he voiced the states as a solution 
to an excessively powerful federal government. How do we explain this? How do we explain that James Madison in the 1780s wanted nothing but a stronger national government and in the 1790s seems to be resisting it? There are several ways to answer it. The first one is why bother trying to explain this? People change their minds, right? Uh, and it's a fundamental principle of historical inquiry that I happen to wholeheartedly believe in that people are shaped uh, by the age and the moment in which they live. And so uh, perhaps James Madison simply did decide in the 1790s that he was wrong earlier. That's one possible answer. A second possible answer is that it wasn't James Madison, but Alexander Hamilton who had changed, uh, that, the, that they may have shared a political vision in the 1780s that Alexander Hamilton took to new and un, un, unforeseeable uh, uh, limits in the 1790s. A third possible answer, and, and the historian Lance Banning uh, has argued this, is that Madison really wasn't as much of a nationalist in the 1780s as we often think that he was. I don't think this is right, however. And a fourth possible answer has recently been posited by Gordon Wood, and I think he largely gets this right, although I'll, I'll, I'll amend it in, in, a, in a, a particular way. Gordon Wood believes that Madison was a nationalist, but he was a nationalist of a particular sort. That is, he hoped for a new federal government that might transcend parties, become a kind of judge over what's happening at the state level. He, in, a, in short, he wanted, and this is uh, uh, Gordon Wood's words, a disinterested and dispassionate umpire in disputes between different passions and interests in the various states. A national government that was pr principally designed to evade popular majoritarian politics in the states by refining the level of conversation. That is, bringing it up to a national level with larger electoral districts that would allow for the right sort of men to be elected. This, for Wood, is quite unlike Hamilton's vision for a federal government, which is really a fiscal military state, more of the modern style. Madison may have wanted a strong natural government, national government to act as an umpire within the states, uh, or in the disputes between the states. Uh, but he had no intention of creating a modern war-making state, such as Hamilton uh, may have had in mind in the 1790s as Treasury Secretary. Which is why, for Gordon Wood, there's no inconsistency here. That Madison wanted a umpire, uh, the federal government to serve as an umpire between uh, in states, state disputes, and not a powerful European-style government. I think Wood gets it largely right, but the solution to the apparent Madison problem may be simpler still. You put it in simpler terms, and the apparent contradiction loses much of its heft. I would put the matter this way. Uh, the location of the primary threat to the republic had changed. Before, it was unchecked legislative majorities in the states, with their state laws, their debt relief legislation, and whatnot. That changed in the 1790s with Hamilton's plans for the assumption of state debts, the details of which Madison believed to be sorely misguided, the creation of a British-style national bank, embarrassing attacks by George Washington and his allies of the, uh, in the administration on the Democratic Republican societies, which Madison believed were healthy, beneficial gatherings of citizens for mutual education, for citizens' watchfulness of the government. All of these made it look to Madison like the federal government just had to be resisted. Truth be told, his Virginia resolutions, which he authored in resistance to the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, and, and of the Adams administration, do provide a challenge to those seeking a consistent Madison between the 1780s and the 1790s. He insisted there that it was the state governments who ought to interpose themselves. Uh, he did not use the term nullification. Between an abuse of federal government and the citizens who might suffer from its policies. It is indeed a surprising statement for a man who wanted a stronger national or federal government that had veto power over the states and not vice versa. But he saw the, new, the crisis of the 1790s as a new chapter in American political life. And he brought a, a political worldview, a quite similar political worldview, to address these new problems. He believed the greater threat to the liberties of the people, to the very revolution they had so recently waged, was found in the central government. And just as he had earlier imagined the federal government as a useful check on the excesses of democracy within the states, so he could see the states as a useful check on the excesses of federal power. This idea of divided government using confederation to solve problems, to make the unprecedented scale of the American Republican experiment work to its advantage, is quintessentially Madisonian. And perhaps this attention to the Madison problem can help us think more often about Madisonian solutions to problems in our own day. Thank you. 
Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.